So today I thought uh, what I would do would was is to um, just go through kind of like the history of Taekwondo because I, I guess, you know, we all do Taekwondo and I can't see myself. I don't know why. Did you turn off? Oh, your camera is blurred. That's why. Um, yes, so we all do Taekwondo and it's, I think, quite useful to understand kind of like a little bit of the history. Um, and it is quite an interesting history. Now, because most of you guys are kids, I'm not going to go into like huge amounts of detail, but um, especially for the adults, like it's a very political kind of espionage field story, um, the foundation of Taekwondo and kind of like how it um, developed in the early years. So there's, there's definitely lots to go into, but today I'll keep it kind of brief uh, and, and service level probably. So today we've, we're going to go through two different versions of the history. Uh, so one is the, the idea that Taekwondo is like a 2000 year old martial art. Um, and when I was young, on the back of, of some of the dobox, like the black belt dobox, we used to have this picture um, of two, two fighting characters like this in kind of like old style drawing. And then it used to say 2000 year old history at the bottom. So when I was young, that was the kind of uh, the, the majority of my understanding of the history of, of you know, the, the, the martial art I was practicing. Um, as I got older, I studied a little bit more and read a couple more books and stuff. Um, for the adults, this book is really, really good. Um, this is more like a biography of one of the people that we're going to talk about today. Uh, but it's, it's like half biography, half history lesson. Of, uh, a, a guy called General Choi. Why are you always like off mute, Harry? I don't understand. Um, so if we go into the 2000 year old history kind of column, we are going to go back into what was called like the three kingdoms period of Korea and three kingdoms. They were because the old days, there were wars all the time, different Kings everywhere that wanted to, you know, take over more land and everything else. Uh, in the Korea region, Korea slash Mongolia region, um, the Shila, Goguryeo and Bakje um, kingdoms were the were three main kingdoms around 9 AD. So um, what you can see from the map on the side is that like Seoul is here and Korea is here um, and you have near Mount Bektu um, is kind of like the existing border of where North Korea kind of ends. What you see is the Balhae area of um, what was still kind of considered early day Korea back then uh, actually extends into kind of like China and Mongolia as well. So, um, you know, at 9th, 9 AD, 2000 odd years ago, the Korea slash uh, Mongolia area was a much bigger area than it was today. Off to the side, you have the uh, Tang Dynasty, which is China, um, part of what is today China, um, and the Shandong region. Um, so Shilla was the smallest part of the Korean, uh, out of the three Korean kingdoms back then. Uh, and they partnered up with the Tang Dynasty to kind of like take over the other two kingdoms. And uh, once that was done, the Shilla just uh, found out that the Tang Dynasty wanted to control the Shilla Dynasty as well. And they were like not having any of that. So um, eventually they kind of uh, went against the, the Tang Dynasty there. So during this time, there were these group of um, fighters called the Horang. And the Horang were kind of like the rich people and the nobility's children. And uh, they were originally trained by Buddhist monks or a Buddhist monk called Wong Guang. And he set out to kind of teach him self-defense, confidence and self-control. And he set out some 
different code of ethics for the Horang to follow. But the Horang is kind of like the first time you see in Korean history where martial arts starts appearing. And uh, later on, there's this martial art called Horang Do, which, um, you know, is probably trying to link back to the martial arts that these fighters uh, used to do. So in that time, in the time of like the Horang um, fighters or, or warriors, the two main types of martial arts were Sirum, which is a wrestling martial art, uh, and one called Subak, which is not, it sounds like watermelon, but I'm pretty sure it's not watermelon. And uh, later they, they changed the name of Subak to Tekyon. So this, this painting here is a very famous painting and it shows a couple of people up the top there who are doing Sirum, wrestling each other. And then two people in the middle who look like they're kind of dancing a little bit, uh, and that's Tekyon. Now, because of where Korea is, surrounded by China, Japan, and Mongolia, they were always involved with fights with the different countries. Um, so, you know, other methods of martial arts, like Gundo, which is archery, um, came down from the Mongolians. And they also had, of course, sword fighting arts. Uh, which were called Gumbo. And from the video, you can see um, some of the kicks that they used, right? And there's a lot of kind of high kicks, a lot of jumping kicks. And that's why um, there's a lot of links that get drawn across from Taekwondo and Taekyon as well, because of the style of kicking. Um, now, if we look to the more recent history of Taekwondo, there's uh, another element that, that comes into play, um, and that's karate or karate, right? The original Okinawan karate was brought from China, actually, and it's the original Okinawan karate is more similar to Kung Fu. So uh, one style of Kung Fu that was very influential uh, is called white very similar uh, to some of the techniques that they use now in, in karate still. The character um, that was used for kara in back then was a different character than it is today. So they used the character kara which meant Chinese. So karate back then was like Chinese hand um, and that is going to pop up again actually in in the history of taekwondo in like the early 1935 1935 a master called gichin funakoshi uh, he organized and simplified the okinawan karate and turned it into something a little bit uh gentler in a sense that can be and more like a sport that can be taught in the japanese school system um, so, you know, I always thought karate was a really, really, really old kind of martial art, but the karate that we see mostly today is actually uh, still like less than 100 years old, which is quite surprising. When um, Master Funakoshi or Sensei Funakoshi, I guess he would have been, uh, changed or, or organized uh, the, the new karate, uh, he changed the character. So instead of calling it Chinese hand, he changed it to character for empty, which is today's martial arts name. So today's karate means the way of the empty hand. Um, but in, in Japanese, it's pronounced the same, um, both using both characters. And uh, Funakoshi's karate became what's called Shotokan karate, which is uh, one of the biggest karate schools still. Now, Korea between 1910 and 1945 was actually run by the Japanese. So the Japanese had come in during one of the wars uh, and then they took over the Korean Peninsula. During this kind of like 35 year period, wealthy Korean families sent their kids across to Japan to study and make connections because uh, that was the way that you could kind of try to, try to work in that Japanese occupied 
Korean environment um, and then try to do business and all of that type of thing. So it was quite important. If you could afford to, you would send your, your kids across to Japan. One of these students was uh, someone called Lee Won Guk. And uh, Grandmaster Lee studied karate under uh, Sensei Funakoshi and also Sensei Funakoshi's son when he was over at university there. Uh, so he, he was apparently the highest ranked Korean um, to get uh, in, in the Shotokan karate system. And he came back to Korea after he finished his studies and he tried to ask the government a few times whether he could teach karate in Korea. But normally when there's an occupation, the occupying forces don't want the locals to learn martial arts because they're afraid they're going to have some sort of rebellion. Um, but you know, Master, Grandmaster Lee must have been quite influential. He tried probably two times, I think it was, and eventually was allowed to teach. So what he did then, he, he called the martial art Tang Sudo, uh, which is Korean for Chinese hand. So that old name for karate is coming back again. And uh, the school that Master Lee founded was Chungdokon, which is the same school that, that we're part of uh, still today. Uh, a couple of years later, there's uh, another Korean who wasn't from such a rich family, apparently, um, but still was able to get across to Japan and, and study. Uh, his name was Choi Hong Hee. He later became a general in the Korean army. Uh, he also learned Shotokan Karate from Sensei Funakoshi over in Japan. Uh, and while he was in the military, he was very, very influential. He, he led kind of um, large groups of it. Of course, being a general, um, you know, you're, you're quite high up in the hierarchy there. Uh, there was another person, he's a captain in the Korean army called Nam Tae Hee. So he was a Chung Kwan student. Um, and he was really, really famous because during the Korean War, he and his battalion fought apparently nonstop for three days uh, without sleeping. And they just like fought and killed a lot of um, the invading Chinese forces uh, during that three day period. So he was very, very famous for that. Apparently when he was doing the fighting, it was at night, he couldn't, you couldn't see who he was fighting. So what he would do, he would try to like tell who the opponent was from the haircut. So if the person had really like a shaved head, then apparently that was the hairstyle the Chinese soldiers had. So he knew it was a Chinese opponent. But if the person had longer hair, then he was a ally. He was a Korean or American um, soldier. So then he wouldn't like try to kill them basically. Um, so uh, Master Nam Tehi was, was very, very famous. Um, and after the Japanese left Korea, uh, Korea had a, a president called Re, uh, President Ri, and he's uh, quite responsible for the development of Korea from an agricultural type of a farming country into the Korea that you know today. So within about 50 years, he turned the, he turned the whole country around. Um, which is quite a, like quite an impressive feat. Now he did, you know, like all dictative, more a dictator style. So he probably did some other questionable things, but uh, he did do quite a lot of good for the country overall. Um, thank you for drawing that. Uh, now I'm recording this as well, so we're gonna we're gonna put this on YouTube later. Um, so during a, a present a demonstration that the army did. Um, President Ri, oh, so Master Nam was doing the demonstration. He apparently broke 13 tiles with, you know, his a punch, um, and it was very impressive. So after the demonstration, President Ri comes up to General Choi and says, "Hey, what's this martial art called?" Now, this is it's like makes it very tricky for General Choi because uh, he couldn't call the martial art Tang Sudo. Right, because that was referencing directly karate. And in this kind of post-Japanese occupation Korea, like the, the Koreans didn't like the Japanese because of all of the history that was there over the last 35 years. 
So Jeron Choi had to really quickly come up with a name. So he remembered Tekyon from the early history. And then he said, oh, this is a, a new martial art. It's a Korean martial art. Uh, and eventually he came up with the name Taekwondo. Right? Now the Taekwon and Taekyon, they're different words in Korean, but they sound quite similar. So he kind of borrowed that name, uh, the Taekyon name a little bit and uh, eventually found a, a new way to, to call a martial art. Uh, General Choi and Captain Nam created a school called Otokwan. So there's Chongnukwan, then Otokwan. Otokwan is very much the military um, arm of, uh, of the, you know, the, the new schools. Um, and the two of them also created what's called the Changhong, Changhon patterns, or Changhon Hyun, Hyun or Changhon Tul. Uh, and these are still used today in Tangsudo schools. A lot of Tangsudo schools still exist in America. Uh, Changdokon Dojang. So we uh, used to teach all of these Changhon patterns. And when you get to black belt, I start teaching you again, these uh, the Changhon patterns. And the ITF Taekwondo, which we'll talk about in a second, still do the Changhon patterns as well. But the ITF people do the patterns a little bit differently. So uh, from here, what's happened is like there's a separation. So Taekwondo was named in about 1962, uh, 63, something like that. Um, then the International Taekwondo Federation or ITF was formed in 1966. And uh, another organization called Gukiwon was formed. Gukiwon actually means I think national gym, right? It's a national training center. So that was formed in 1972. Uh, World Taekwondo is another organization that's separate to Kukiwon, but they're very closely linked. Uh, and that used to be called WTF, but because of the acronyms these days, they had to change the name from WTF to WT, World Taekwondo. So that happened uh, four years ago now in 2017. Um, so what are the differences between the ITF and WT slash Googie One style? Um, the ITF is kind of really focuses on power um, and um, they, they kick a little bit differently. So uh, one of the biggest differences is the way Doryotagi is done. So in normal not normal, but in WT, World Taekwondo, Taekwondo, uh, Taekwondo Doryo is normally done with the top of the foot, right? So like we kick here using the top and we kick that way. Um, in the ITF style, when they do Doryo Chagi, they use up chuk. So they pull the toes back, pull the foot back and use the ball of their foot, uh, just like you would do in up chuggy, right? So it's, it's, there's a very big difference. But the reason why it's done is because when you need to hit something very hard, like, you know, um, bones and you want to break bones and that type of thing, uh, the bottom of your foot is much stronger than the top of your foot. So uh, you would use the bottom of your foot to do your doluchagi if you wanted to, you know, break something very hard. Um, so we still do that uh, when we do, you know, kyokpa for thick wood. So if you do your black belt grading uh, or dan gradings, then you have much thicker wood uh, and you have to use the bottom of your foot. Otherwise, you know, you'll hurt the top of your foot and, and break some bones probably. Um, and uh, a couple of the other differences would be like duihiryotagi, so reverse turning kick. In the ITF style, the reverse turning kick is, has a straighter leg as you come around. And in the WT or Cookie One style, then it normally has a bit of, uh, it's more like a hook kick, right? It, with the name, Dui Hiryo Chaki. So those are two big differences. Um, and, I'll, and three or four years ago, they did a, a demonstration. So the WT team and the ITF team both did a demonstration. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. Now, Cookie One and World Taekwondo, like I said, is like the different things. Guki one is responsible for um, kind of like the certification and 
uh, a little bit more of a more traditional style of of taekwondo or taekwondo and world taekwondo is definitely more the sports arm so if you ever see kumse competition or if you see um uh, kyorugi competition you know that is tech, that's world taekwondo right and that's the rule set for the competitions everything else that comes out of the world taekwondo side Guki one side is more uh, your instructor training your belt system grading criteria and uh, things like hoshin sul and uh, kyokpa that kind of stuff comes out more from the cookie one side and world taekwondo side is definitely more of the um, competition side <laughs>